Hello lovely people, I'm K3N and welcome to this episode of my park home life. And Stella's here wondering why I'm talking to myself again. You know, oh and Fred Fred's here. Um, <clears throat> in this episode I'm going to... Stella's... Sorry, she's batting her tail against the blanket box. Go down boo. Good girl, go down. Sorry about that, working with animals you know. Um, Yes, in this episode I'm going to take you to the Simmonsbury Estate in Bridport, or just outside Bridport, in the West Country of England. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful estate. I think it's 1,500 acres of um, farmland and buildings and so forth. They have holiday cottages um, and galleries. And why I went there specifically was because my group, CQ West, had an exhibition in one of the galleries there. Um, so I'm going to take you and show you that. And also we're going to have a little walk, Stella and I, um, up the hill on the estate, which is called Colmer's Hill. Um, so I'll take you along with me. Um, it was a very steep hill and there was a lot of huffing and puffing. So um, yeah, it was, but it was a lovely walk. So apologies for the heavy breathing. Um, I couldn't do differently. <laughs> it was really steep. Um, and then after that, I'm going to show you my bedroom because I've taken out the wardrobes um, in there. So if you watched the last episode, I think it was when I did the tour, um, you'll have seen those big dark wooden wardrobes at the one end of my bedroom. And I just wasn't happy in there or comfortable or um, I even kind of found myself in the evening sitting here thinking, um, you know, I don't really want to go to bed. It, it's strange, isn't it? How important environment can be. Uh, making ourselves feel cosy and comfortable, especially, you know, at certain times in our life. And the other thing I've been thinking about that I'll talk more about later is how the process of slow stitching, which is primarily why I started this channel in order to share that, um, the, the ethos of that can translate into all other aspects of life. So I want to talk a little bit more about that at the end. But first we'll um, hop over to Simmonsbury, we'll have a look around the exhibition and we'll have a walk up Colmer's Hill. So I'll see you again in a bit. Welcome to Simmonsbury Estate, this beautiful hand-drawn map. I'll just go in a little bit closer so you can see some of the details. So here's a list of everything that's on site. And we are in number 10, the South South West Gallery. And you see there are all kinds of other galleries and shops of independent makers and so on. And then if you look up at the top there, you see the car park. Um, and then you see the path to Colmer's Hill that we're going to go up in a little while. And Colmer's Hill is right up there top left with the trees on top. And then there's the tithe barn and the garden, and the courtyard area with the plants for sale, and the cafe, and the gallery itself. It's lovely. So if you're in Dorset, if you're ever in this part of the country, it's well worth a visit. You can look around all the lovely shops and galleries. You can have a walk up Colmer's Hill if you feel like it. And um, there's lovely donkeys and goats to visit over there where it says animal viewing. I would have filmed them, but they're right over in their shed. Now I've just let the cat out of the bag that I'm filming this last. Um, and then you can go in the cafe and have a coffee and um, a lovely lunch or a piece of homemade cake. So yeah, strongly recommend. Oh, and down there at the bottom there, you see, is the kitchen garden. And the WC, very important. <laughs> and the little chapel. So I hope you enjoy the visit and um, the exhibition and the walk up the hill. And I'll see you in a little while. Okay, so here I am in the manor yard of the Simmonsbury Estate. Now the Simmonsbury Estate covers around 1,500 acres of farmland um, and they promote sustainable farming which is wonderful and also they have the, the kitchen garden which you saw on the map where they, um, they use a no-dig method of growing which is much better for soil health and so forth and um, all the produce in the cafe um, for the lovely meals and so forth is, is local, whether from the farm or the kitchen garden. It's just a wonderful place. There are holiday cottages, there is um, a glamping field, you know, with posh tents. Many galleries, like I said, and shops and independent makers. They run workshops and guided walks, foraging walks, all kinds of things. If you're ever in the west country of England, um, I highly recommend a visit. So here's the South South West Gallery. And there you see in the window it says um, 
Well, there's Stella going by, her reflection. <laughs> She's outside but reflected. Uh, it said CQ West, sorry, unfolding stories. Um, there's Stella on the lovely cobblestones. Um, and these beautiful big sculptured heads standing outside. So here's the little door. So in I go um, into the vestibule. Try not to, Stella was it was very difficult filming whilst holding Stella on the lead, but anyway. Um, so in we go. I'm going to show you the the words. So if you want to pause the screen and read it, I'm not going to read it or you know focus on it for ages, but that's hopefully long enough if you want to read what it says um, about our exhibition. So I'll just take you on a little tour. So there are all our handmade cards. Um, and there are some cushions and some little bags and necklaces, all made by our members. Um, what am I doing now? Oh yes, and this is Sylvia's piece that you see as you first come in. I really like the gallery that it was little little areas, little rooms, it was all divided up, it wasn't one big open space. But having said that, it mid did make it more difficult to film because there wasn't much room to step back. I mean, here I'm showing you Wendy's beautiful vase of, I think they're sunflowers on vintage linen but that's I'm, I'm nearly with my back to the wall there um, and the other thing that I loved was that um, the the chap who runs the gallery Phil he painted some of the walls grey to show off the work better there on the right are some of my eco printed pinnies aprons um, I'm going back to show you the bags again oh yes because there is a little rice bag do you see it's all squashed <laughs> looking a bit sad <laughs> Um, these are some of Sylvia's lovely little slow stitch bundles so that you can make little slow stitch books. Um, cloth necklaces again. We really have such variety in our members. I think there's 18 of us. I should know. I think there's 18 of us at the moment, something like that. And su But such variety in the way we all work. Now these little collages are from Cara and they were not in the Nailsworth exhibition back in May. Much of the work was, but Cara joined us now for this exhibition. She wasn't able to in May. And these are little stitch collage collages that are kind of a journaling process for her as well. So often she'll go on a walk and come back or sometimes actually, you know, take bits and bobs out with her and stitch a little collage to reflect the walk or some aspect of her day. So it's kind of a visual journaling. I think that's really inspiring. And they look beautiful here um, against the grey wall. And it's quite hard to stop the, the glare on the glass. Apologies for that. Um, and there's my eco print pinnies flying on the wall there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to turn around now and go further in there are sort of three main rooms, how it was set up with these little dividing walls. So coming through there, you see Anna's work, which is about the plight of young people in children's home um, in Britain. Um, and then looking right through to the far wall there, you'll see, um, I was going to go into this next room, sorry, but there was someone looking through my forager's journal there on the left. So I went through to the end first. Um, yeah, on the far wall there you see Lucy's beautiful big wall hanging with those joyous wood nymphs leaping across. It just always fills me with joy every time I look at that piece. And then there's a lady walking by who's in our community. Hello, um, Carol. I think it was Carol. I may be wrong. she came to see me anyway. That was her just going. <laughs> um, and the way it was curated, because it was hung and curated not by us, which we usually do it ourselves, but by Phil who's an artist himself, I just loved it. I mean, it's, you know, obviously personal preference. But the way he'd kind of colour coordinated, he put work together that, you know, you see there that little um, piece hanging in the frame, how it goes with Lucy's big quilt. Um, and here the colours in Jane's three um, long pieces pick up the colours in Chrissy's rice bag there on the, on the floor. I thought it was so such a fabulous job that he did. Um, and here you see those two pieces on the left are from Judy and then the piece on the right is Sylvia's but he's picked up the red lines in both of them um, to put, put those pieces of work together. This lady is also in our community. She hadn't come to see me. She was just there on holiday but she knew me. She, she's, she follows us, you know, but she hadn't seen that I was there or anything. <laughs> so she just walked in and said, oh, are you K3N? And I said, yes. 
and um, she knew Stella, of course, so she gave Stella a fuss. And I said, oh, have you come specially to see me? She said, no, I didn't even know you were here. <laughs> that was quite funny. So anyway, so and she said she didn't mind being in the video. I did ask her. Um, so there's uh, Wendy's natural dye samples hanging there in that long piece. Just beautiful. Now, these pieces I am going to show you because this is other work from Cara um, that wasn't in the Nailsworth exhibition. I will link to that Nailsworth video that I keep talking about if you want to go and watch that as well if you hadn't seen it. Anyway, these pieces of Cara's are vessels made from leaves. This one, for example, is called Seeds of Hope. I just love that idea of taking a leaf and making a seed pod out of it. It's kind of, you know, a cyclical journey. And this little piece here is like a cornucopia. Um, all stitched. Stitching real leaves, if you've ever tried it. We did it a little while ago in the Monday Project. But to form three-dimensional shapes with them is, you know, above and beyond. It's very um, challenging, and Cara does it beautifully. Now, this piece here is three water lily leaves. This piece is called Lily Pot, um, that, stitched, that make the outer vessel. And then she's stitched a flower from cloth, a water lily flower, to put in the heart of the leaves, as if the leaves are a nest that hold the flower. Um, and those actually came out of my friend who I stayed with when I first came back to England, out of her pond. So that's a lovely connection as well. I'm going to go around the other side just to try and show you the colour on this other leaf because it was beautiful. But my shadow comes in. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> Look at that beautiful pinky purple. All natural. She hasn't painted it. That's just how it was. Lily pot. And this is, you'll have seen um, similar vessels if you saw the Hanging by a Thread exhibition that I shared recently. This is called Flow. This is a vessel made from found materials, natural materials, and also um, river mud or river soil. Um, I don't know if there's cloth twine in there as well. I think it looks like there is. I think there's a base of cloth twine. And then she moulds the, the mud from the river around it. And then that's Stephanie's beautiful triptych there, hanging on the wall. And then there's my forager's apron. Um, and then this is our felter. I think she's currently our only felter, Marion, who's um, this triptych of felted pieces, which I just love. They've also got natural materials, leaf skeletons and so on, trapped in them. And the way they then tone with dots, um, still lifes, next to them. Yeah, I just, yeah. Here's the Forager's Journal. I'm, I have very mixed feelings about this now. It is so of the place where I lived in France. Um, it's quite hard for me to look at. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I have to go and collect it on Monday. We'll see. We'll see. If you want to see it in more detail, there is a full, a full video um, called The Forager's Journal. Where, and you can you know look at every page if you want to. <laughs> um, so... Well, that's turning back round to look back down the way I came in. And then there's a little statue of Stella and Fred Fred fighting. And now we'll go up Colmers Hill. OK, so we've come outside and we're going to go up there. Do you see that hill? Do you see, do you see? That's Colmers Hill. And I've just stopped here on the path. I've already walked up a little bit, that's why I'm huffing and puffing. See the roofs down there, that's um, where the gallery is. But I wanted to show you this beautiful ash tree. That's the base trunk. Do you see how it's must have been pollarded or something at one point? So now it's got these branches coming out to the sides and then going up are all these trunks. It's huge and it goes as far in the other direction. It's beautiful, gnarled, and the vine twining around the base there. So, I've got Stella on the lead because I think there's sheep. And she's pretty good with sheep, but you know, the sheep don't necessarily know that, so I'll keep her on the lead and we'll walk up there. We've just come through a gate into a field and we're weaving our way around to go up the hill. Just wanted to show you the view and the sun's come out, it's so beautiful. So I'll just scan gently round. 
and there were sheep. You'll see them in a minute in the field that we just came through. It's a bit grey over there, but hopefully it won't come this way until we've got down the hill again. There's the sheep, and that's where we came through. So we're on this lovely grassy path. If I was a bit younger, I'd want to roll down that hill. <laughs> but I'm not going to, because then I'd have to climb back up again. Plus, like I said, there's sheep, so there's, you know, evidence of sheep laying around, shall we say. Um, it would be great for tobogganing if it was snowing. So we're going to walk on a little bit and um, see what's next. There's a cute little cottage at the end of this lane at the foot of Colmer's Hill. So cute. Okay, we're approaching the summit. I'm a bit out of breath. Usually I'm telling Stella not to pull. But now I'm saying, Stella, pull, pull me up the hill, and she's not obliging. Sorry for the huffing and puffing. <clears throat> oh, hello sheep. And this um, access path is kind of on a ridge, but the bracken's a bit high, so I can't really show you. Maybe when I get to the top. Ooh, it's quite steep. <clears throat> Plus, I just had a coffee and a cake in the cafe, just having a breather. The cake, if you're, I don't know if it's in other countries as well, but in the UK, oh, sorry, we have something called millionaire shortbread, which is kind of a biscuit base with toffee and then chocolate on top. And that's already quite naughty. But in the cafe here, and it made me laugh because we were talking about um, words to use for exaggeration. You know, I say five million of something. And quite a few of you said your exaggeration word was gazillion. And this was called gazillionaire shortbread because the biscuit had all kinds of syrup in it and the toffee was really thick and toffee -y. and the chocolate was really thick and chocolatey and it was quite a big piece but I managed it so now I'll walk up the hill is just what's required and hopefully now I've got my breath back I do have to turn because Stella's tied her lead around my legs so you get a little view going back look how beautiful it is there's all kinds of paths you see the paths going up there through that field where the sheep are on the right but today we just go up the hill and back down again that's enough. <laughs> and the ash trees all along. I just so love to see healthy ash trees because so many ash in the UK have got dieback disease. So when you see healthy ones, it always makes me happy. So anyway, that's enough <laughs> pretending to look at the view while I get my breath back. <clears throat> and up we go. Sorry if it's wobbly. But I thought you might want to share in the moment when we reach the summit. Good girl stairs, pull. <laughs> what do they say to huskies? Mush, 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 mush. <laughs> She's not paying any attention whatsoever. <clears throat> the shape of the trees on the top of the hill. It's like something from Lord of the Rings. I hope there's no, um, what do they call those things? Jackie, if you're watching, you're shouting at me. Jackie is our Lord of the Rings expert. The, oh, I nearly had it. The Nazgul. Them things. I hope there's none of them up there. And I think, oh, those are definitely pine. I don't know if they're European pine or Scots pine or a mixture of the two. Oh, it's getting even steeper. I won't talk, you can just watch and listen to me breathe. In fact, maybe you could kind of run on the spot whilst you're watching this to get the full, you know, experience. <laughs> Nearly there. I hope there's a seat at the top. Whew. There we go. Oh, there are lights. I must light it up at night. Oh. And there's a trig point. Or a triangulation point. 
That's what the Ordnance Survey use when they're mapping. Oh. Let's have a look. And someone's lost their glove. See the glove? I'm going to put it on top. I don't know if they'll come back for it. It's probably a child. Styles, come here. Put it on there. If they come back, they'll see it. Yes. And do you see it's got a number? If you're in the UK, you probably know this, but... It's got a unique number. And tiny traces of lichen on it. Here and there. So anyway, let's look at the view. Shame about this plastic fencing around, but anyway. Stella, she's tied around my legs again. Right, so I'll scan. So that's where we came up. Sorry, I was just picking up Stella's lead. We might get wet going back, it's suddenly gone very grey. That's where we came up there. Look down there, you see the path going back down, do you see it? Between the bracken. Oh, there's lovely old pine trees. And then here and there, if I get closer. If you can see through them to the view. Just walk around slowly. Try not to trip over any brambles. And Stella keeps... <laughs> I'm sorry, she keeps going around the wrong side of me and then the lead's around my legs. So I have to drop it to pick it up again. No, you can't really see because of the trees. This way, we've got a view. <clears throat> and there, we've got a view. See, down there, that's where the gallery is. That's the Simmonsbury estate down there. So we've come all the way up from right down there and then going further into the distance you'll see another village whose I can't place what it is. There's not, not one of those handy things up here, you know, that tells you what you're looking at. And if I go this way... When I was a child and we were on journeys to the seaside we had a game where I was the first one to spot the sea. So get ready to shout when you see the sea. You have to say, I see the sea! Ready? Here we go. Do you see it? <laughs> Over there between the sky and the land. Faulty Towers fans will get the reference. <laughs> and right on the horizon is a big ship. I don't know if you can make that out on the video. Sorry about the wobbling, that was Stella having a little roll in the grass. And you see there's a path going down the other side. I'm not sure how far that one goes. But yeah, it's lovely to be able to see the sea from the top of a hill. Let's have a look around here. I can smell these pines. I wish there was smell-o-vision. That lovely piney smell because it's just rained. And it is quite warm, actually. I've got a jumper on, but I don't really need it. And I think over there as well. Now it's focusing on the pines. You see the sea over there as well. Can you see it? So there we are, it's the top of Colmes Hill. I've done all the hard work so you didn't have to. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, before we go through and see the absence of wardrobe, shall we say, and the visible mending that I did to, um, you know, sort it all out, I just thought I would show you my studio because I shared a photograph a little while ago in the community pages of my cheese box shelving um, and then I put a video on Kofi but not all of you will have seen that. So here is my cheese box shelving in my studio which is made from 10 old cheese boxes which I bought um, from Facebook Marketplace and I've screwed them to the wall in this configuration that you can see and they're just brilliant storage. And this label up here, sorry nearly dropped you, just above the teddy there can you see, can you see, there's an Australian cheese label from the town of, is it called Gurgar or Jurgar? And 
one lovely person called Margaret, I think, I'm sorry, I get names wrong sometimes, um, emailed me with lots of information about that little town in um, Victoria. Sorry, I hope that's right. Um, and, and the cheese making and so on and how the, the label probably came over to the UK in about the 1940s, I think. Um, but that was, So that was so kind of her and a lovely backstory for my Australian cheese label on a cheese box that I bought in Somerset. And the other thing I've done, which wasn't in the Kofi video either, I'll just go gently so you don't get dizzy, is I've done this here. So across the end here, I'll show you, it's just a bit of MDF wood. You know this, well, you know, this chippy recycled wood, squashed together stuff, I think it's a technical term. So I bought that, it was slightly too big, so I cut it with my saw. And it's just sat on there actually. And then underneath, I just made, screwed to the wall a, a batten. Do you see the batten there? Screwed that to the wall with my handy dandy screwdriver. Um, and then I've put here, this is some of that net wire we call it in the UK, because I'm going to make a curtain for that. So that's all stuff there. No stalls. Stella's wondering what's going on. That's all um, boxes which I've labelled so I don't have to, you know, wonder what's in which. Because I've moved everything around, it's hard to remember where things are, so I've labelled everything. So that'll just hide that. I mean, it's not mega untidy to look at. I think it will just look nicer with a little curtain. And then I'm going to make my G's Bend housetop inspired blind for that window. I don't know, hopefully those will at least feature in the next episode. That gives me two weeks. We'll see. So we'll go out of here. Um, there's my mum's doll, Susan she was called, she is called. This is a painting made, done for me by Sheila who's in our Facebook group. I must get a frame for it, it's there to remind me. Well in fact I've got a frame for it, what I need to do is make a mount for it. It's on my list, it's on my to-do list. So let's go and have a look at the new bedroom. Well it's, you know, it feels new, it feels like a whole new room. So this, in the corner here, that's where the head of my bed was before, if you remember. That's all the stuff that needs to go in the wardrobe. So that big bag and the hanging stuff and a basket with some wool in that won't fit in the studio and my little file box with all my household paperwork in. Um, and where that bag is standing, I've, I've got a wardrobe coming on Saturday, just a white, you know, laminate wardrobe flat pack that will go in there in this corner here where my hand is showing you so that will be low-key big enough for all that stuff so I've now put my auntie's drawers there under the window they just about fit under the window frame um, I've look at all this space I could have a party in here in fact Fred Fred and Stella last night did have a party in here there was a big wrestling match went on on that rug um, I'll go this way my mirror, which was on there, is now resting on the floor, which means I can admire my feet, but not much else. Um, I really don't want to part with it because I've had it for years and it's a beautiful mirror. Um, I don't dare hang it on the wall because it's so super heavy. So it's just leaning up there for now. I've got it well lent up and I've put the basket of stitch journals in front of it. So it can't, you know, fall over on Stella or Fred Fred. That would be awful. And here, finally, after all the wittering, is my bed and I've moved the westering sun up onto that wall there um, and I'll talk to you in a bit when I'm sat back in my chair about getting the wardrobes out but while I'm here I'll show you what I've done to replace you know to make good as it were because the coving you know that stuff that goes between the ceiling and the wall stopped in front of the wardrobes so I had to take that out and it was, you know, it all fell, crumbled apart as I took it out. So I had to get new coving to fit where it's white. I didn't have enough of the grey paint left to do the rest of those walls grey. But I did have plenty of the white, well, just enough to do two coats. So I moved the burning times over to there because that was here. And I put this rainbow one. This was actually a workshop sample. I used to teach this as a colour theory workshop years ago. Um, sorry, my hand waving. Hello. Um, 
I put that there because it's shorter, you know, the burning times came down below the head of the bed. But it's so, it, honestly, I can't tell you how lovely it was to sleep that way around. It's, you know, the bed has swung through 90 degrees and moved a few feet, but it's such a difference. And to have this space in the room here now. And um, I'll just take you in and show you what I did here, because here, oops, this wall has been drywalled, plasterboarded, and this wall is just the original plywood wall. So there's a about half an inch or so gap. And this was just raw plasterboard on the end. So I bought this wood, this is just some L-shaped wood trim. And I glued that up there. And then I painted it grey. So that that finishes off the grey wall. And then the white wall. It's, it's, kind of, it's visible mending, I think is what I like to call it. <laughs> some might say it's a bodge job. I'll call it visible mending. There's the westering sun again. Um, and then the same at the other side, you see. So it's kind of the history of the, the room was that there was a wardrobe there. Um, and now, you see, there's a little gap in my coving there. I cut that corner not very well. But, you know, I did it. I did it and it's fine. And this here, behind that little bit of cardboard that I've masking taped to the wall, is a PowerPoint that had been shoved in a wall there. And it looks like it's all wired incorrectly. But I don't really want a PowerPoint like that, so I'm trying to get an electrician to come to move it down for me, on, you know, under the bed. So meanwhile, that's just to make it safe in case it isn't safe. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to show you, because a few of you asked me, is how I hang textiles to the wall. I'll show you with this one. I'll just get it down. So I've just got two screws there in the wall. Do you see? Do you see? And on the back of the quilt, I've stitched this hanging sleeve. It's a sleeve, and then through it is a piece of wood, a little batten. Just a little batten of wood. And in each end I've screwed one of these little vine eyes, we call them, I think. Roundy things. And then that hangs on the wall. Now the thing about when you stitch a hanging sleeve is you need to do it in such a way, do you see that there's a pleat in the top? That you can see that. So you, you need to, some fullness in it. So you stitch it down there and then you, you lay it on as if you were going to stitch it down flat to the quilt, but then you pull it up a little bit and then stitch it so that the top part of the sleeve has some fullness to it. Otherwise, if you have it flat to the quilt, when you put your um, batten in, there won't be anywhere for the batten to sit and a lump might show on the front, whereas this way, do you see the batten's held in the sleeve? So I'll put that back up in a bit because it won't be easy with one hand. So I hope that was helpful if you were one of those people that asked. I tried to explain in the comments, but there's nothing like showing, is there? So there we go. So that's my new bedroom. Um, so I'll go back to my chair and I'll have a little chat with you about creativity and so on. Oh, and I moved um, that one there, the mirror cracked, because there, I'll just show you. There, that's where the wardrobe's going. So that would have hidden all those, those two quilts. Get down, Stiles. Good girl. You want to say goodbye to the people? Well, not goodbye. Au revoir. Go down. There's a good girl. So I go back to my chair and I'll um, witter on for a bit longer. See you in a minute. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, the tour of the exhibition, the walk up Colmes Hill and the little look at my bedroom. Um, and the, the wardrobe's gone and so on. And I said that I wanted to talk a little bit more about creativity. I've just realised I haven't put my glasses back on. Anyway, never mind. I don't need to see in order to be able to witter. Um, I, um, yes, I've been thinking a lot about the process of slow stitch and how I talk about trusting the process and, you know, immersing yourself in that rather than focusing on the end result. And I've been sort of trying to apply that to the journey that I'm on at the moment, which is uh, difficult because when I'm stitching, you know, that's my happy place. I love stitching and sewing and creating. 
um, whether it's journaling or you know the slow stitch. So to take that idea of really focusing in on the process and the feelings and so forth and applying that to something that isn't necessarily always joyful and pleasant, i.e. life, um, and, and my life at the moment and the adjustments that I'm making and, and going through is challenging, but I've never really been one to shirk a challenge, so I thought I'd try. Um, and it got me thinking about creativity in general, not only creativity in all the things that I do and we do, I know many of you, most of you are, are creatives as well, um, but, you know, creativity, how it can be applied to life. And when I wanted to take the wardrobes out, I tried to get a handyman to come and do it for me because I thought it was too big a job. And I was laying in bed one morning looking at the wardrobes and I'd really struggled to get someone to come to do that. I tried, you know, a few different options, but nobody, the, 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 the best I could do was somebody who could come at the end of November and I didn't want to wait that long. Um, so I thought, so I lay in bed and I was thinking about the, the process focus thing and I thought, okay, Catherine, focus on the process. What's the first thing that would need to be done? That would be taking, getting the stuff out of there and, you know, finding somewhere to store it temporarily. So I did that. I got all my clothes out and um, the other bits and bobs and put them in my little studio. And I thought, right, well, what would the next thing be? Well, the next thing would be to take the doors off. So I took the doors off. I've got my cordless, you know, <laughs> screwdriver thing. So I took all the doors off and I took them all outside and put them neatly in my shed. And I came back and I looked at the, the carcass, you know, the framework of the wardrobe and how, and it was really fitted in there. It was really fitted. It wasn't just standing there. It was fixed to the wall and, you know, fixed to each other, full height. It was this great big thing. And so that started to become a little bit overwhelming. And I was thinking, no, no, I'm really going to have to get a handyman to come and do that. And I thought, well, what would be the next thing? Well, the next thing would be to get the internal shelving out and the hanging rails and the drawers, you know, and all those bits and bobs. So I, get all the, I got all those out. That was relatively straightforward. It was just undoing some screws. Some of the screws were a little bit harder to undo than others. They were, you know, stuck tight in there. My cordless thing wouldn't do it. So I went and got a handheld screwdriver and, you know, gritted my teeth and did my best. And eventually I managed to get all the screws out. And once you're on that journey, whether it's something like that, that, you know, I wanted it done. I was very goal focused, but in, in order to get to my goal, I focused on each step and it wasn't meditative truly in the same way, of course, that stitching or so on is, but it was really just about not being overwhelmed by the whole task that needed to be done. But just saying, right, well, the next thing you need to do is this. So how are you going to do this? What are the challenges that this this one particular task, you know, it might be just one screw. What does that face? How do I overcome that? And and that's what I mean, really, I think, by applying the ethos of slow stitch to, to even removing some old wardrobes, you know. So eventually I got them all out. You've seen the end result. And I'm so happy I had a wonderful night's sleep. Um... It has been said to me in the past by someone who shall be nameless, but I might as well have named him because I think you all can guess who I'm talking about. Um, it doesn't matter about the, the bedroom, the room that you sleep in, because when your eyes are closed, all rooms are the same. Well, all rooms are not the same when your eyes are closed. You, you feel. Someone in the comments said here, um, when I mentioned that in a recent video, that when your eyes are closed, all your other senses kick in even stronger. And that is true. And I really felt that last night when I you know, turn my light off after I'd read a little bit um, to settle down to sleep in the dark that I felt that I was somewhere different. It was the same room, but it was different, you know, and I felt happy and comfortable and I had a really good night's sleep. Um, so thank you to, to you. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the person who said it, who said, no, not all rooms are the same when your eyes are closed, because I've been told things for years as if they're absolute truth. And, you know, you start believing. Anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> Going off on a tangent. So I also wanted to talk about creativity itself because that's it's it's the, a human attribute that we all have. Whenever I hear somebody say, oh, you know, you're so creative, I'm not creative. 
I, I, in my mind, I, I say sometimes out loud, depending on the person and the context, yes, you are, because you're a human being. If you're a human being, by definition, you're creative. You know, you can't get away from it. We just are. I had one lady some time ago admiring my textiles and my sewing and, and saying, oh, I'm not creative at all. And, you know, so I sort of was having a little chat with her and it turned out that she made cakes. You know, she baked cakes and she decorated them. And she talked me through some of the cakes she'd made for her grandchildren. And she's, you know, it was so creative, the ideas that she came up with. So, you know, I didn't go, no, 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 you are creative. But, you know, I did it in a nicer way than that. <laughs> Because it, it's true, it's not just me saying it, it's absolutely true. And if you don't believe me, I'd like to refer you to someone else. Um, I've got a book here. Um, this is by Liz Gilbert, Elizabeth Gilbert, who famously wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will have heard of it already, but I've started reading it again, I think, for about the fourth time recently. Um, and it's called Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear. Um, and it's wonderful, it's very readable, you know, whatever, whether you're someone who likes kind of esoteric type ideas or whether you're a more practical person, I think you can get something from it. Um, she talks about what I just mentioned, I think it was on page 90. Uh, where are we? Uh, if I can find it, here we go. If you're alive, you're a creative person. You and I and everyone you know are descended from tens of thousands of years of makers. Um, and then she goes on to say, the guy, hello Fred Fred. <laughs> Fred Fred's, although he's not human, he's kind of creative. He creates havoc wherever he goes. <laughs> um, I'll try and go on, although you're probably all now looking at him. The guardians of high culture will try to convince you that the arts belong only to a chosen few, but they are wrong and they are also annoying. We are all the chosen few. We're all makers by design. Um, your creativity is way older than you are, way older than any of us. Um, uh, all of which is to say you do not need a permission slip from the principal's office to live a creative life. Or if you do worry that you do need a permission slip, there, I just gave it to you. I just wrote it on the back of an old shopping list. Consider yourself fully accredited. Now go make something. And if you don't know Elizabeth Gilbert and her writing, that's very much the style of it. It's almost as if she's there in the room talking to you. And, and there's so much in it about, I mean, she's a writer, obviously, so she's creative in that sense. There's only the half hour, so you only get one bong. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend that, you know, you, if you find this secondhand or you buy it or you get it from the library, if you haven't read it, it's it's really, really inspiring book. If you're one of those people who thinks you're not creative especially or doubts your own talents or abilities she speaks to that as well you know just make just do don't worry about a perfect outcome so that's yeah highly recommended book so that's pretty much it I hope you enjoyed this episode thank you so much for being here as always um, it, it means so much to me to have you here on this journey with me and thank you so much for watching and I look forward to you joining me next time for more Park Home Life Tales. Bye bye.